Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The GSMC Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank everyone out there for listening. I am your host, Kayvon Izami, as always, and we've got a great show in store for you today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, however you're listening, wherever you're listening, whenever you're listening, we thank you for being a part of the podcast, baby. The ratings have gone up. We've seen a lot of five stars. I even got a nice little comment the other day. It was awesome. I really appreciated that. So whoever gave me that comment, thank you so much. Um, that really does mean a lot to me. Remember, you can always tweet me at Kayvon underscore sports or on the um, account page uh, at GSMC underscore football. Either way, I will always answer and I'll give you a shout out if you want to talk about something here on the show. But we are filled. We are stacked with content today. We are right around the corner. And you know, I told you guys last two shows ago that these next two weeks are the biggest weeks when it comes to figuring out if we're going to have sports back on a nightly basis. And I I said I really don't feel like that's hyperbole. Like I, I really think that's true, and I still do to this day. Then on Saturday, I came and and I told you guys that it's looking awesome. You know, baseball's back. NBA's about to be back. NBA doesn't have any positive tests. NHL doesn't have any positive tests. Um, And I gave you guys false hope. And I'm sorry, because since then, we have had a whirlwind of problems with baseball. An entire team is shut down. Two other teams aren't playing because of that, the the Marlins. And uh, the NBA... I mean, the NFL is now looking at this like, what? And we're going to talk about what happened with the MLB because we're going to relate that to how the NFL can look at that and say, what do we need to do? Because remember, yes, it's two different sports, but they are the only two sports that are doing this not in a bubble. They are the only two sports that are traveling from city to city around the U.S., They have to be watching each other because they mirror each other in the way they're going about this with COVID. So that's something we're going to break down. Um, And and this is where we're going to get right into our first segment because I don't want to go over and I want to give a lot of time to get into it. But quickly, what we're going to do is we're we're going to start um, we're we're going to start the show with with a talking about the trade. You know, you know, we got to start the show with the Jamal Adams trade. If you guys remember, I said on the on the last episode that the Jets need to send this guy out ASAP. I said that on the last episode, less than 24 hours later, it happened. Now, I'm not saying Joe Douglas, the GM of the Jets, listens to the show or anything, but pretty weird coincidence if you ask me. Just, just, just a weird coincidence, that's all. Um, after we dive into the trade... We're going to talk about what's going on with the NFL right now in terms of COVID, just just like I talked about earlier. And, and I, I have a, uh, I have an idea that I, I think the NFL should take a look at. It, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect in this day, in this age, and, and, and this year um, with the pandemic that we're in. Um, and, and I'm sure that my listeners, some of you guys I'm sure are way smarter than me. Maybe probably all of you guys are way smarter than me. So you guys might find some loopholes in that. But that's fine. I, I want to put this out there and see what everyone thinks. 
Um, then we're gonna do we're we're gonna I, I have a oh I have a bone to pick with a lot of players, coaches, and executives for coming up with a list and leaving Carson Wentz off of it. I could not believe my eyes when I saw this list. So trust me, we will get to this because I have a lot to say on it. The, these, the, some of these lists, man, some of these lists, I just, I don't know why they do it. I don't know why I pay attention to it. I'm addicted to it and it always ends up getting my blood going. And now I got to come on here and, and I got to vent about it. And I think a lot of you guys are going to be agreeing with me on this one. Um, after that, we're going to continue the Cave on Division Tour as we head to the AFC North, break down that division, give you the predictions. You guys know how it goes. Uh, we've been doing the tour for a while now, and it, it's a lot of fun. And then to end the show, we're going to play a game called Too High, Too Low, or Just Right. And you will have to stick around if you want to find out what that show entails. That, my friend, is called a Grade A Tease. Chris Berman would be so proud. They don't teach you that in school. All right, so let's get into it. It's the big news of the week. It's the big news of the week. We talked about it last segment, last episode, excuse me. I told you guys that Jamal was making too much noise, but that's not why he was traded. And and we'll get into that as we go here. But I knew this was coming. I, I knew this was coming, but the crazy part is how this happened and the amount that it happened for. All right, so so let me just read it to you off the bat. As we know, Jamal Adams was traded. The New York Jets traded Jamal Adams to the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle got Jamal Adams and a 2022 fourth-round pick. New York got a safety in Bradley McDougal, a 2021 first-round pick, and a 2022 first-round pick, and a 2021 third-round pick. So essentially... The Seahawks got a safety and a fourth round pick in 2022. The Jets got a safety back in Bradley McDougal, a good safety, not Jamal Adams, but a good safety, two first round picks back to back, 21 and 22, and then a third round pick in 21 as well. So the first time, whenever a big trade happens, you know, this is the first time a big trade has happened since I became a host of this podcast. And I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty excited. You know, a, a trade gets me amped up. Usually you see trades happen like this all across the NBA all the time. And, and I and we don't get to talk NBA on this show, we talk NFL. But NFL is starting to turn to that trend, which I really, really like. It, it, GMs are starting to be more aggressive, trades are starting to happen, and boy do I love breaking down a trade. So... This is the first time of me getting to break this down to, to my, my lovely, my amazing audience. So I get to teach you guys my trade model. Now, this is a secret. I, don't, I, I hope you guys respect my trade model. You don't go around telling other people about it. So my trade model is how I break down a trade. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down both teams in different ways using this model. Now, whenever a trade happens, I immediately ask myself a couple of questions right away. I get my pen and my notepad, you know, my pen and, and my notepad that I always talk about. First question is the one that everyone asks, and that is who won the trade? We, we all love that question, right? That, that's, that's the million dollar question. That's the talk show shebang. You, you always have to ask that. And, and that, that's always the main question. So a couple of things with that question. First of all, there isn't always a winner. That needs to be put out there. Some people think they always have to pick a winner. That is false. There, there does not always, there is not always a winner in these trades. Both sides can come out good. Both sides can come out bad. One side can come out better than the other. That, that, that's how trades happen. Now, I do have an answer for that question though of who won the trade. There is an answer to this one, but I'm going to give you that answer in, in just a little bit. The next question I always ask is, did either team give up too much, too little, or the perfect amount? Let me give you an example so we're all on the same page here. Because I want you guys to, to, to follow along with me through this. Earlier this offseason, the Texans traded wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins and a fourth-round pick to the Cardinals for running back David Johnson, a second-round pick, and a fourth-round pick. Immediately when that trade happened, 
I pulled out my trade model and I knew right away that the Texans just gave up way too dang much. I mean, the Cardinals robbed the Texans at gunpoint and got away with it pretty much. And so so that, that's what I mean by was there too much given or not enough. And then the third and final question I ask is, what's the impact? Is it an immediate impact? If so, how much better does it make the team today, instantly? Or is it a future impact? And if so, what does that mean for the team today? And then what has to be done to make the future impact worth the trade? You guys follow along? All right. So now let's dive into the model. You guys know what I'm, how I'm using the model. Let's dive into the trade. Let's first look at it from the Seahawks side of things. Then we'll go into it from the Jets. The Seahawks side of things is very interesting uh, to, to me because it, it, I think it depends on how you look at it. And I told you guys the way that we're going to be looking at it through that model. So the first question of who won the trade, we will skip because we're going to answer that in a little bit. The second question, did Seattle give up too much for Jamal Adams? Yes, they did. Right off the bat, I can answer that question. Yes, they did. Let me start off by saying this. I would not have made this trade. If I was John Snyder, who's the GM of the, of the Seattle Seahawks, general manager of the Seattle Seahawks, I wouldn't have made this trade. Let me rephrase that. I wouldn't have made this trade for the amount that Seattle had to give up. Not for two first round picks. No way. And on top of that, they got a starting safety in this league in Bradley McDougal and a third round pick. That is just way too much. Jamal Adams is a really good player. And I, I mean, he is a really, really good player. But that is just, that, that is too much for safety in my eyes. Now, before I want to, before I go any further, I do want to say this because I, I don't want to sound like I'm contradicting myself. How, how many times have you guys heard me criticizing a team like the Green Bay Packers for not going all in with, with Aaron Rodgers as their quarterback? For not making big, big impactful trades and, and saying, screw the future. We have Aaron Rodgers. We need to win now. I'm always talking about that, right? I've said that many times. So I want to be clear here. I love that Seattle is taking a risk. I love that they are saying, hey, we have Russell Wilson, one of the best quarterbacks in the entire game. We have a window right now, and every year as Wilson gets older, that window closes a little bit. So let's go all in. I love that attitude. I really do. But the problem is they went all in at the wrong position. Again, I love the risk. I love the go get it attitude. It's just a little rich, a lot rich actually, for my taste when it comes to a safety. It's the wrong position for the go get it attitude. And I'll answer why that is. Jamal Adams is a fantastic player. I, I mean, he really is a good safety leader. And I want to, the reason I keep saying that is because I want you guys to understand this has nothing to do with Jamal Adams. And the Seahawks have the luxury of doing a trade like this because of the spot they are in as a team. I get that 100%. They are in a much different spot than the Jets are. They are a perennial playoff team. So they felt they can make this trade, and they are correct. They can make this trade. And Jamal Adams is a really good player. But let me ask you a question. My listeners, my great listeners, my third question of the model. I'm going to break this up into two questions for you guys and girls. Does this make the Seahawks better tomorrow? I'll give you a couple seconds. Think about it. Think about it. This, this is an easy one. We, we, we shouldn't take too long on this one, right? The answer is yes. I, I think we can all agree that adding Jamal Adams makes your team a better immediately. No doubt about it, right? Now, let me ask you the second part. How much better? Does this trade make them? Does this trade take the Seahawks from a playoff team to the Super Bowl favorite in the NFC? I'll give you a little longer on this one. Think about it. Think about it, all right? This is the real debate here. Take your time. You got your answer. 
All right, good, because I have mine. No, it does not make them a Super Bowl favorite. And if some people are out there saying, why does it have to go from a playoff team to a Super Bowl favorite? Because you don't give up that much for one player unless you're going all in to win the Super Bowl. This does not make them a Super Bowl favorite. And again, it has nothing to do with Jamal Adams himself. He's a top three safety in the league. It has to do with the position. A safety to me, this is my opinion, a safety to me doesn't take you over the hump. I personally would rather spend that money that they are going to have to pay him with on the other holes that they have on this team. They need help on the offensive line. Russell Wilson is literally the reason that they're a perennial playoff team every year. But they do not protect him well enough. They never have. For some reason, Pete Carroll has never invested in the offensive line the way he should. A safety does not get you to the promised land. Even as good as Jamal Adams is. And oh boy, is that dude good. It's just not a position to me that makes a big enough impact. I would rather take a risk on a defensive lineman. On someone that can wreak havoc on the quarterback of the opposing team every play. Or on an offensive lineman. Someone that's going to protect my quarterback, my CEO, every single down. Or a top wide receiver like DeAndre Hopkins. Or even a cornerback like the Rams did with Jalen Ramsey. Because at least Ramsey is going to lock down an entire half of the field. A safety to me doesn't have the impact. Now, if Seattle was to make it to the Super Bowl... Well, then Adams would that then Adams can then be a player that can make a play or two for them during that game to help them win it, win it. There's no doubt about that. Adams can make those plays, but you first have to get there. You have to get to the Super Bowl first. And they have shown us that they have too miss many missing pieces on that team to make that happen. I, I mean, listen to this. Listen to this stat right here. The C- Seattle outscored opponents. By a total of 7 points last year. 7 points. They went 11-5. and five And outscored their opponents by 7 total points all season. That means that they are winning almost every game by one possession. By single digits. The 49ers, to put that into perspective here. The 49ers, their division rival outscored teams by 169 points, and they went 13-3. and three. They only won two more games, but they outscored opponents by 169 points. What does that tell you? Think about that, listeners. What does that tell you right off the bat? I'll tell you right now what that tells me. It's Russell Wilson and Russell Wilson. It's Russell Wilson that wins the games, Russell Wilson is the reason why they make the playoffs. Russell Wilson is so dang good, he makes up for the holes in their ro- their roster. Yeah, they make the playoffs each year widely because of Russell Wilson. And this isn't this isn't the old Seattle team. This isn't the Legion of Boom. And that is no disrespect to this Seattle team. They have some really really good players on the roster. There's no doubt about that. And what's the one thing we always say about the NFL? It's the ultimate team sport. But there's something else we always say too. And that is a really good QB can do wonders for your franchise. If you have a really good QB like the Seahawks do, you can make the playoffs. You can win regular season games. Shoot, you can even win your division sometimes. But it stops there. Because there will always be another team with a better all-around roster. And that's how you win playoff games. That is the difference between San Francisco and Seattle. San Francisco throttled teams all year. Seattle squeaked by teams because their quarterback was good enough to make that one extra play. I mean, look at Seattle. Since 2015, 
See, since 2015, they made the playoffs four out of five years and lost in either the wild card or the division round every single time. They haven't won a real meaningful game in a lo- like playoff game in a long time because once you get to the playoffs, having a really good QB can only get you so far if you don't have the pieces around him. Look at Aaron Rodgers. That man has taken his team to three NFC Championship games since 2014. That is a total of six seasons, and out of those six, he has made it all the way to the game right before the Super Bowl three out of those six times. That is really good in the NFL. Two out of those three games, his Packers got completely pounded. And trust me, one of them against was, was against my Falcons, and there well, it wasn't even a game from the start. Because it's the NFL, and eventually there will be another team that will have a much better roster than you, and the greatness of your QB can't overcome that, and nor should they have to. We have the same thing in Houston and Deshaun Watson. He takes the Texans to the playoffs every year based on his athleticism and his skill, but he takes a beating doing it every single year because they don't have a run game and they don't have an O-line to protect him. So yes, of course the Seahawks got better. Of course they did. They got a, the top three safety in the league. Some people would even say the best. But that's why I take my model a step further. I ask how much better. And when we live in a world when the end goal is a championship or fail, Jamal Adams does not take them to that championship level. It just doesn't. Now, one last thing, then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to dive into the Jets side of things. Seattle also made a massive mistake when they made this trade. I, w- I want to ask you, you girls and guys another question here. Do you know what that mistake is? Take another second. You got it. If your answer was that they didn't sign him right away after they made the trade, then you are correct. Huge mistake not to sign an extension right away. Look, Jamal Adams now has all the leverage. Jamal Adams will laugh, laugh at the highest paid safety right now in Eddie Jackson with Chicago, who's making $14 million. He is going to laugh that money away if Seattle puts anywhere near that money in front of his face. We have seen this happen recently with Laramie Tunsil and the Texans and Jalen Ramsey, Jalen Ramsey with the Rams. You cannot give up two first round picks to a player or to another team for one player and then not immediately sign him because now you have all the leverage because you can't give up that much picks and then let him walk. The player knows that. The player's agent knows that. And now you're going to have to sit back and your owner is going to have to open up a blank checkbook and Jamal Adams is going to write and sign the money that he wants. A massive mistake on Seattle's side after making this trade. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. We're going to take a quick break when we come back. It's time to look into the Jets side. All right, Seattle got better. They did. But I told you, my model said they gave up way too much. They got better. But they didn't get to the point. They didn't get to the promised land with this trade. What does this do for the Jets? We'll be right back to discuss it. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
This is the GSMC Football Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kayvon Izami. Thank you all for tuning in. Hope you're all having a wonderful week. A couple of days away from NBA starting back up. Training camp is underway for the NFL. And it's, uh, you know, we're going to see how things go. As I said, I, I feel like I kind of led you guys down the wrong hole the, the, when I told you guys that things are looking really positive. Um, and now we have a lot to talk about, and we'll dig into that. But I want to start this second segment off where we ended the first, talking about the Jets side of things. We, we just discussed what happened with the Seahawks. And then also remember, coming up in two segments from now, we're going to end the show with an awesome game of too much, too little, or just right. Stay tuned, and you'll find out what that means in just a little bit. We just talked about Seattle side of things. Jamal Adams, fantastic safety. Some would even say the best safety in the league. For my money, I go with Tyron Matthew, but he's up there. Jamal Adams is up there. So no doubt, we asked the question, I asked you guys, we, we know he, the Seahawks got better, right? But how much better? To me, it's not over, it's not taking them over the Super Bowl. To me, it's not putting them over the 49ers. They're a playoff team. If they get a couple good bounces in the playoffs, maybe they can get to the NFC Championship games. Game, excuse me. But their roster has too many holes in it. So to give up two first-round picks, plus a starting safety, plus a third-round pick, I'm sorry, but I would want to make sure I'm getting someone back that is plays in most, an impactful position that can take me over the top. I don't think a safety can do that. I do not think a safety can do that. So, from the Jets side of things, we have to look at it from the Jets. The Jets were able to get two first-round picks out of a disgruntled player. That right there in itself is a massive, massive win to me. I mean, you guys remember, we I I I went at Jamal Adams pretty hard last, last episode because he was acting like a baby. And he kept on doing it. Look, Diana Rossini, who works for ESPN, does a, does a fantastic job. She said after the trade that she asked around to different league general managers and head coaches. And she said, and I quote, almost everyone I talked to said that the Jets fleeced Seattle in this trade. And I agree. It's a huge win for the Jets. So there's my answer for the first question. The Jets won this trade. Now, Again, I told you guys at the beginning, when a trade happens, there isn't all there doesn't always have to be a winner and a loser. It doesn't always have to be that way. There's different ways to look at it. The Jets won this trade. I'm not going to say that the Seahawks are losers of this trade, that the Seahawks lost this trade. I'm not going to say that because again, they have the luxury of making a trade like this. They're a very good team. They're a perennial playoff team. So I don't think you can call a perennial playoff team a loser of this trade when they add a starting safety that's top five in their position. But they don't win the trade because it doesn't do enough for them. And they give up way too much in the process of doing that. I hope that made sense. Now, let's go back to Friday. Just for a quick second. When Jamal Adams went to New York... When, when Jamal Adams went to the New York Daily News and threw his, li- and threw his little temp- temper tantrum and went off on his head coach and his GM, him doing that could have completely derailed this trade. Look, look at this trade. Look, this trade was clearly in the works. It, it didn't just happen on that day. Like, so, so you get what I'm saying? So the fact Jamal Adams went and threw that temper tantrum and that could have ended the trade because the Jets the the Seahawks could have saw that and said no no so the fact that the Jets were able to still and Joe Douglas the Jets GM were able to still get two first round picks a third round pick pick and a third and a pretty good safety in in uh, Bradley McDougal is very impressive and, and I don't know if we should be giving that credit to Douglas or if we should be asking 
why in the heck did Seattle's GM John Snyder not use that to help his bargaining position? I mean, he easily could have said, whoa, whoa, you have a mess on your hands right here. I mean, Jamal Adams, your, your player is going to the, the da- New York Daily News and calling you out, Joe Douglas, calling your head coach out. I mean, you guys want to get rid of this guy, don't you? I'll, I'll be doing you a favor to clear that mess up. So instead, I'm only going to give you a first-round pick. That easily could have and, and probably should have happened. I don't know why it didn't. So the fact that Joe Douglas was able to get a massive haul back for a Jamal after all of that, I, I think whatever way you look at it, it's a win, win, win for the Jets. So that answers our second question of the trade model, right? That the Jets gave up Jamal Adams, so we were asking, did they receive enough in return? And I would say they definitely did. There's no doubt about that. That then turns into question three. Did this make them better? I think we all would once again agree that this did not make the Jets better today. When you lose a top three safety in the league, you don't get better from that. Not right away. This is a future impact trade for the Jets which is the exact trade that they needed to be making at this moment. Remember, I said Seattle can make that trade because they're a perennial playoff team. The Jets are not, and they weren't going to get there anytime soon. When that, which that, which makes us then ask two questions. What does this mean for the team today? And how does that team become better in the future? Because that's the purpose of getting draft picks, to get your team better in the future. Now, the picks will most likely be lower first-round picks because Seattle is good and they usually pick within the 20s. So you have to hit on those picks. You have to. Also, you get back a starter in McDougal. He is no Jamal Adams. He's not that good. But he's still a starting safety in the NFL. And he had a really good year last year. So you're good on the safety position for now. And there are so many holes in the Jets roster. And that's why I love this trade so much. These picks can help you fill those holes. You can use these picks to surround your rookie QB with legit talent. Because he has not given, he has not been given the luxury of having a talented roster yet. But I know what most of you are saying. I, I know it. I can. I, I know my listeners. You're saying to yourself, how is this going to change the Jets? Because we've seen this team draft many times now. And at the end of the day, this is still the Jets. And they have not done anything in recent years. I mean, you're right. Look, from 2013 to 17, that's five years worth of picks. The Jets had six first round picks during that time. Before those six players got to their second contract, the Jets had traded five of them and cut one of them. So clearly, they have not been utilizing draft picks to their advantage. So you ask, what's the difference? Who says they're not just going to go blow these draft picks? That's a fair question. It's a very fair question. And I think the only answer you can say is it's Joe Douglas, the current GM. Now, we don't know if Joe Douglas is going to be able to change this franchise around. Time will tell that. But we can look at what he's done so far. And we can pretty pretty obvious say that he's doing a really good job and he has a great idea of how to run a stable franchise in this league. And you can just look at the couple things that he's done in the first draft that he had this year and free agency. And then him being able to get that much back for Jamal Adams. All faith has to be in Joe Douglas to go out and hit on these draft picks. That is why this year is so important for Sam Darnold. The Jets have to decide after this year if Darnold is their guy or not. If he is, then you use those picks to build around him. If he isn't, then you can use those picks to package them together and move up and get another QB. This year is everything for the Jets and for Sam Darnold. And remember, 
Remember, guys, Joe Douglas did not draft Sam Darnold. He is trying to build a team here. And if he doesn't see that Sam Darnold, as there is his guy, is the guy that can get them to becoming that perennial playoff team, to becoming what Seattle is now, he is going to be more willing to go out and find his own QB then. You know these GMs. They want their own head coach. They want to pick their own head coach, and they want to pick their own QB. But he likes Sam Darnold because he took this job. You don't usually take a job if you don't like the quarterback in place, especially if it's a young one. It's a huge year for Sam Darnold to show what he has. And I said this many times. Sam Darnold has not had the luxury of playing for a team that has put real talent around him. If he can get that chance, then I think Darnold can be a legit starting QB in this league. I really do. These picks and Joe Douglas making those picks gives him that chance. It's all or nothing in on Sam Darnold and Joe Douglas. You got to get it done. You got to get it done. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We just broke down the big, big trade of the offseason. Jamal Adams going to Seattle. We like to think that the Jets won this trade. And we broke that all down for you guys in our trade model. I hope you enjoyed that. I really do. Um, So we're going to move along here. We're going to now talk about what's going on with the NFL right now today. We, We now have 19 players that have decided to not play this season. We're only a couple day. We're only two days into training camp starting, really. You know, it start it opened up on Monday, and we now have 19 players that have decided to not play this season. They they are opting out to play this season, and the list is growing. It will for sure be more than that probably by the time this episode comes out tomorrow. The Patriots are one team in particular that have six players on their own team that have so far opted out. And we are slowly seeing the dominoes fall as more and more players make this decision. Now, I want to explain this to you guys real quick because I I, I had to read about it and make sure I knew what I was talking about. There are two categories involved when it comes to a player opting out. You have the high-risk opt-out and you have a voluntary opt-out. If you are a high-risk opt-out, you are given a $350,000 stipend, and you do not have to pay that back. Your contract will be put on pause. So, for example, if you have two years remaining on your contract, then next year when you come back, you will have two years remaining on your contract. Again, nothing changes. So far, we have only, we have now seen three players receive the high-risk opt-out. We've got uh, the Vikings defensive, defensive tackle Michael Pierce, We've got the Patriots offensive lineman Marcus Cannon. And we've got Washington's defensive lineman Caleb Brantley. All the other names we have heard from so far are voluntary opt-out. If you take a voluntary opt-out, then you can get $150,000 salary advance. And same situation happens with your contract as the high-risk opt-out. You still will get your same contract when you come back next year. Now... If you have a family situation, if you have someone that just had a baby, or if you have someone you live with who is regarded as a high risk, you can ask your organization to give you separate housing for that family member. So you can be separate from them and not have to worry about getting them sick if you if you were to contract you know, if you were to contract the virus. So far up until today, we haven't had the quote unquote big name player. But now that has changed. It, you know, it looks like we have a bunch of big names players. I mean, Dante Hightower is deciding to opt out uh, of this season. For, uh, f- uh, player of the Patriots, star linebacker of the Patriots. From what I am reading, he recently had a child, so he wants to make sure he is keeping his child safe, and that is completely understandable. You know, we also have Green Bay Packers wide receiver Devin Funches. Buffalo Bills defensive tackle Star Latulier, who received a big contract over the offseason. A really big contract over the offseason. 
Um, we've got New England Patriots safety Patrick Chung. Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver Marquise Goodwin. That hurts the Eagles. That really hurts the Eagles. That was going to be their, their deep threat, their speedster wide receiver. See, this is when things start to get very interesting because these are big name players. Hightower is a very big name, big impact player that was set to make $8 million this year. And he's leaving that on the table. Now, that salary will be there for him next year, but he's getting older. He might retire. He he is leaving that t- money on the table as he has decided to opt out. And I want to quickly say this because I brought up the first player opting out last episode. At, at that time, it was just the first player. It was the offensive lineman for the Kansas City Chiefs, Laurent Duvernay Tardif. Um, and I didn't get to say this, but I want to say it. I really hope that I don't hear anyone out there criticizing these players if they decided to opt out. Whether some people want to admit it or not, this virus is extremely scary. And I fault no one if they decided to sit out this season, whether they do it for the health of themselves or their family. It does not matter to me whatsoever. If you are a player that makes that decision, it's courageous of you and I applaud you for that. And I get it. We look at it like, wow, 8 million bucks. How can someone walk away from 8 million bucks? Well, it's bigger than that. We're talking about the safety and well-being of you and your family. And there's no price you can put on that. You can put to make put that in jeopardy. And real quick, I also applaud the players that do want to play. That also takes a risk. That also takes a lot of courage. This isn't something where you have to pick sides here. Every situation is different, and that's okay, and we should respect all of those decisions. Sometimes we get carried away, and I do it myself, and we forget that these players are human beings. This is a deadly virus, and if a player wants to opt out because physically, mentally, for their family, whatever, they don't feel safe, then that is totally Fine. And we should all be okay with that. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. Hope everyone's enjoying the show so far. I do want to dive into something before we take a quick break. Because we did just talk about the Patriots and how they have so far six players sitting out. And and some very impactful players as well. And Dante Hightower... Um, and Patrick Chung on their defense. You know, it's funny because I can already see people, I've already actually seen people asking me this. Well, Kayvon, we remember you did your AFC East breakdown, and uh, you picked the Patriots. Are you going to change your pick now? I'm not backing off my pick. Does this worry me? Of course. But this season is all about adapting. This goes for every team out there. The teams that can adapt the best will have the best success. Look, it was already going to be a very tough coaching job for Bill Belichick with Brady leaving and all the key defensive players that left in free agency. And now that all the defensive players that are opting out through the virus. If Bill Belichick, I wanted to mention this. If Bill Belichick can rally this team with this current roster to the playoffs, It will hands down be the best coaching performance of his career. Hands down. Especially with what has departed on the defensive side of the ball. Because we knew Brady was leaving and we knew that Cam Newton was entering. And they didn't have many weapons. But we always kept saying, they've got a stacked defense. Look at their defense last year. They've got a stacked defense. But now... They're losing pieces left and right. All of his signal callers from last year are gone. Dante Hightower, gone. Patrick Chung, gone. Tom Brady, gone. So there is no question that Bill is going to have to bring out every piece of coaching magic he has this season. And if he can do that and pull this off and take them to the playoffs, it will be his best coaching performance of his career 
by far. And every coach is going to be under duress this season, not just Belichick. Character, leadership, adaptability, accountability, these are all things that these coaches have to possess if they want to be successful this year. Whichever organization and whichever coach and whichever GM can adapt to the virus the best will have the most successful season. Throw talent out the window, ladies and gentlemen. Throw having the best coach out the window. Throw having the best organization out the window. All that matters is the organization of today. Whoever is in place in the, as the owner, as the general manager, and as the head coach, can you three come together and adapt and change your organization on a day-to-day basis to make your players safe so that they don't get sick and to change the way you go about traveling, playing games, going from practice to hotels, going from from your the how the players houses to the to the plane, all of this stuff has to be changed and the coaches that can come up with the best way to do that and the best way to use the players that they have, and the best way to create depth when a player does get sick, those are going to be the most successful teams this year. And we're set up for a wild and funky year. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time to talk division. The Kayvon division tour goes on, AFC North. The predictions are ready. They're loaded up. They're smoking, and we're going to come back and give it to you in just one minute. Stay tuned. Check out the show that's built on the MMA, from the UFC to extreme cage fighting. They got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Hope everyone's having a lovely day. Wherever you are, however you're listening, we thank you um, for being a part of our show, being a part of our broadcast, and uh, listening to our content. We wouldn't be here talking without you guys. So love the listeners as always. You guys are great, great, great. Um, now we just finished talking about a, a lot of different things. You know, we we broke down the Jets Seahawks trade in, in great detail. I, I I love going through trades like that, and I feel like a lot of my football nerd fa- uh, uh, fans and fellow friends are the same way that you guys are all about the trades too, especially during an off season like this. But now things are starting to pick up. I mean, it's like I'm checking my phone every second to see, is another player opting out? You know, is another player opting out of which team? How many players are we going to have by the train, by the deadline to opt out on August 3rd? These are all crazy, you know, things that are happening now. And again, I want to be very clear. We're, in, we're living in a crazy world right now. We're living in a pandemic. We should not chastise anyone for wanting to opt out. I don't care if it's from Tom Brady 
to the last man on the on the roster. We should accept every single person's decision, no matter what. We sometimes get carried away, and I am in the same boat of forgetting that these are human beings, you know? Trust me, I've gotten into Falcons games before, and, I, and I've gotten mad, and I'm cheering, and I'm like, why? You know, and I forget that these are people, all right? And, and, and they, they have emotions, and they have feelings, and they have family. And um, whatever decision they make, I stand by them, and I respect them, and they have courage for making that decision and coming out and making a very, very tough decision. These players love football, and these players want their money. So they're losing out on money when they make this decision, and we all have to understand that. Now, what we're going to do is it's time for our uh, to continue our division tour of breaking down the AFC North. We're going to give you our predictions, as we always do. Um, and then we're going to go from there into segment four, where we're going to play the game of too high, too little, or just right. And that's where we're also going to break down our... Uh, I'm going to give you guys my little feud on Carson Wentz and what's going on there. So stay tuned for that game. I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. Um, There might be some special guests joining me for that as well to ask me some questions kind of like a couple weeks ago. So stay tuned for that. We'll see. Now, before we jump in to the division predictions, I do want to bring up a very awesome story in, in 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 a, you know, year where there's so many bad stories and so many bad things happening. Um, This is a story when I heard this that I just smiled from ear to ear, and I have a feeling a lot of you guys did, and this was Alex Smith getting medically cleared to play football again. This is such an awesome story. This this is a ma- this is a miracle. It really is a miracle. Alex Smith hasn't played football in nearly two years now. We all remember the horrific, and I am not overselling that word. It, it was very. It was a very gruesome injury he had to his leg. Many people didn't think he would play again. Shoot, when I saw that, I didn't think he was going to play again. And now look, he has worked his way back. He's been cleared. And Washington head coach Ron Rivera said this, and I quote, he said this the other day, he's going to compete. We got the good news that he passed the physical to resume action, and now he has to pass the football physical for us. And if he can do that, then this guy becomes a part of our QB competition right away. It's the truth of the matter. That is awesome. That is awesome, awesome stuff right there. Alex Smith, such a good guy. I love that answer by Rivera. He's showing respect to a veteran QB in Alex Smith, who has done a lot in this league. Now, I don't want to take over this awesome story and the good news by starting to predict if he'll actually play again. I don't want to do that, but I do want to say this. What he is going to do is he's going to be a fantastic mentor for Dwayne Haskins. Perfect mentor. He's going to help that QB room in every way possible. He can. He did what he did for Mahomes. He was the best mentor. Mahomes has said on record many times that he would not be the player that he is today if it wasn't for Alex Smith. He can do and will do the exact same thing for Haskins. This guy is straight class. I could not be more happy for him, and I actually do think he plays in the NFL again. I don't think it will be for Washington because they have Haskins and they're trying to figure this out. I do think he's going to play in the NFL again, but even if he doesn't, he's worked his way back. Such a good dude. Someone that has worked so hard. He first got drafted number one overall. It looked like he was going to be a bust, and then he changed his career around and has been really one of the best quarterbacks Um the really that one of the most consistent quarterbacks we've seen for the last five, 10 years uh, before that injury happened. So well done to Alex Smith. Congrats to him. Now let's get into the predictions. Dun, dun, dun. All right. You know how we do it. We always start off with the predictions within the predictions that that's, that's how it goes. So let's get after it. Best coach. Best coach of the AFC North. These are the predictions within the predictions. John Harbaugh. 
John Harbaugh wears the crown for the best coach, and this was a close one. This was a really close. This was hard for me to decide. I'm not going to lie. I did not enjoy deciding between John Harbaugh and Mike Tomlin. Both coaches are fantastic. Tomlin, 13 seasons as Pittsburgh's head coach. Zero losing seasons. 133 wins to 74 losses and one tie. John Harbaugh, 12 seasons as Baltimore's head coach. 118 wins, 74 losses, and only one losing season. Battle after battle against each other. Battles in the playoffs. John Harbaugh's first year in 2008, they, he goes and loses to the Steelers in the AFC Championship game. The Steelers go on and win the Super Bowl. And we've seen some really good battles against these teams. And it was really hard to pick John Harbaugh. The only reason I did is I just feel like Harbaugh has had a little bit more success of recent. So that's why I went with Harbaugh. Um, But they're neck and neck, and I would not fault anyone for telling me, hey, I think I would actually pick Tomlin on that one. But in my books, Harbaugh wears the crown. Best QB, Lamar Jackson, and I don't even think it's close. Uh, I don't. Baker Mayfield has some question marks. Joe Burrow is new, rookie. Big Ben's coming off a serious injury, and Lamar Jackson just won the MVP. I don't think I need to say any more. Best wide receiver, Odell Beckham Jr. If A.J. Green was healthy, then I would think about picking him. I really would. But A.J. Green hasn't played football in over a year. You cannot pick him. He has so much talent, so much talent, an amazing receiver. And when we see him healthy, healthy, he's a top 10 receiver in the league. But you can't pick him. It's Odell Beckham Jr. Had a bad season, but I see him bouncing back. Best running back, Nick Chubb. He's young. He's good. He came second in the league last year in rushing yards behind Derrick Henry. The dude is a beast. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He can run it. 2019, 298 attempts, so he can take a workload, 100, uh, 1,494 yards, and eight touchdowns. And eight touchdowns his rookie year as well. The dude knows how to ball. Best tight end, Austin Hooper. He just came from Atlanta. I've watched him many times. He's gotten better every single year. 2016, when he was drafted, 271 yards. 2017, 526 yards. 2018, 660 yards. 2019, 787 yards. Austin Hooper is the best tight end in this, in this division. Best overall offense goes to Baltimore. On paper, it is Cleveland. But with Lamar Jackson at the helm, there's no denying that that offense is too nasty to stop. And best overall defense goes to Pittsburgh. I think when it's all said and done next year, Pittsburgh will have a top five defense in in the league in almost every single category. They're stacked from top to bottom. The steel curtain defense is coming back sooner than ever. Let's dive into the division now. You heard the predictions within the predictions. Let's dive into the division. Let's start with the Cincinnati Bengals, all right? Last year's record, 2-14, head coach, Zach Taylor was in his first year as the head coach. Now he's going into year two. They ended up last in the division and, and, and in t- last in the entire league, which got, which got them the number one overall pick and got them Joe Burrow. Head coach Zach Taylor is going into year two as a head coach of the Bengals. He is the youngest head coach in the league. He came from the Sean McVay tree. You remember this was during the time where if you – even looked like Sean McVay or touched Sean McVay, then you were getting a job. Zach Taylor was hired to bring the offensive guru type system to Cincinnati. To his credit, he did not have much to work with in year one. I think the Bengals had one of the best drafts this past April. I think they hit on a lot of their needs. Something else that I was very surprised with and impressed with about the organization is they spent money. They went out and spent money. They actually did. You know, there's been this... um, conception that there, there, there's been this talk that um this misconception excuse me uh that's the right word there that owner Paul Brown doesn't really like to spend money and that's true he he usually does not he usually he's cheap you could say it that way he's cheap for an owner he doesn't go out and spend money on the big players but this year they did I mean they've slapped the franchise tag on AJ Green 
They, they gave DJ Reader defensive tackle a four-year $53 million deal. They gave quarterback Trey Waynes a three-year $42 million deal. They spent money, and, and, I, and I really appreciate that. When you look at that, and then you look at their draft picks, taking Joe Burrow, many would say the best QB in the draft, then taking wide receiver T. Higgins, who had a really, really good career at Clemson. Um, the Bengals have done a good job this offseason, especially on the offensive side of the ball. So now a new era begins. You know, you had the number one overall pick in Joe Burrow, who had who posted the highest single season grade of pro football focus in the college era, our friends over at Pro Football Focus. Burrow has accuracy, he has pocket presence, overall playmaking ability. He, he's a good prospect. They got Joe Mixon as a running back, who I like a lot. He took a step back, but he's proving each and every year that he can be a top running back in this league. They've got, they they really have an underrated wide receiver core. You know, they have A.J. Green. If A.J. Green stays healthy, he you can complement A.J. Green with T. Higgins out of the draft now and Tyler Boyd. And then you put all that together with John Ross, who's the speedster, who I understand he's underperformed for where he was picked in the draft. But you put all those together with a healthy A.J. Green and then Joe Mixon out of the backfield, that is a stacked receiving core. Now, the problem is the defense, the defense is is lacking. They have a lot of holes. And this offense is going to take time to gel. This offseason with COVID, I know I sound like a brokered record, but the offseason with COVID is really going to hurt the Bengals. So while I think that the Bengals will be much better than last season and that 2 and 14 record. It's going to take time to gel. They're not they didn't Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor didn't have a lot of time to talk this offseason to get to know each other, to get to know the playbooks, to get to know what each other likes and and they still have a lot of holes in the roster. Vegas has them at 5.5 win total and because of all of that I that I just said, I have them as exactly 5 wins this season. So I am taking the under on this one. A three-win improvement is not bad for a team that picked number one overall. After that, you've got the Cleveland Browns. 2019 record, 6-10. and 10. Head coach, Kevin Stefanski. Everyone remembers the talk this time last year, right? It was all about the Browns. Browns, Browns, Browns. I remember I was telling my friends, I don't think I've ever seen so much hype for a team that has done nothing on the field yet. So and, and I get it. Baker Mayfield ended the season in 2018 strong as a rookie, and then they added Obadell Beckham Jr., and people were rushing to Vegas to cash the Browns in as a playoff team. And some even went as far as to say a Super Bowl team. I was not one of those people. They, were not, they weren't ready. Baker wasn't ready. They hired a first-year coach in Freddie Kitchens, and it was a disaster. As a result, Kitchens is out. In comes Kevin Stefanski. I do like Stefanski better. He is a first-year coach. I would have gone with a more veteran coach, but whatever. I like Stefanski. I'm not going to complain about that. This all comes down to one thing and one thing only. I'm going to keep it simple with the Browns. How does Baker Mayfield do? They have put every possible piece around him that he needs. He has the wide receivers. He has the tight end now in Austin Hooper. He has the offensive line in Jack Conklin, and they... they, uh, perfected that in the draft, not perfected that, but they upgraded the offensive line in the draft. He has everything that he needs. He has Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt behind him. He has everything he needs to succeed in the NFL. Can he do it? Can he put it on the money? I don't know if he can. I don't think he is ready to take that jump. They have a rookie head coach. Once again, COVID. Whenever you have either a new quarterback or a new coach together, in this type of season, it's going to be problematic for those teams, especially at the beginning. Because of that, the Browns have the Vegas have the, has the Browns at 8.5 wins. That's their win total. On paper, this Browns team should be one of the most explosive offenses in the league. Will they be disciplined though on both sides of the ball? Will they use Odell Beckham Jr. right this time? And most importantly, does Baker take the leap forward? I don't find the answers to most of these questions positive. So because of that, I'm going under. I think the Browns land right around about seven to eight wins this season. So I'm not going over the 8.5. Take that to the bank. Now let's go to the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
2019 record, 8-8. Eight and eight. Head coach Mike Tomlin. The Steelers had no chance for great success last season after Ben Roethlisberger appeared in just two games and then got hurt. It was already going to be difficult as they entered the season without their best two skill positions in Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. In addition to Roethlisberger's injury, the Steelers lost James Conner, Juju Smith-Schuster, Stephon Tuitt, all for a combined 34 games last year. Given that they still clawed their way to an 8-8 eight and eight record and was, was nothing short of remarkable. That was due in large part to a stout defense that ranked in the top six in the league in both total yards and points per game allowed. And the Steelers' defense also forced 38 t- turnovers, which was the most in the league. It also had to do with Mike Tomlin, who truly showed his coaching ability this year. Before this year, he was getting a lot of flack. He was as a coach. This year, he showed the coach that he can be and the coach that he's been for these last 13 years. He did a phenomenal job coaching this team to 8-8. Eight and eight. Now you go into this year with the same defense, taking a step forward, the same head coach. Oh, and also you get your franchise starting QB back in Big Ben. Now, I know a lot of people are down on Big Ben because he's older. He's coming off a serious elbow injury, and I get that. All of those are reasonable. But this is what everyone is leaving out. He doesn't have to be the old Big Ben. He just has to be better than a guy named Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges. A combination of those two would have got the Steelers into the playoffs last year under the new playoff format that's starting this year. The Steelers have a really good roster. You put Big Ben at QB and the offense takes a massive jump. The team gets their leader back. I know I'm in the minority, but I actually think Big Ben is going to have a really good season, but he doesn't need to. He doesn't need to, but I think he's going to be in the running for comeback player of the year. And on the defensive side of the ball, they brought back linebacker Bud Dupree. They had Devin Bush going into his second year. They have TJ Watt, one of the best pass rushers in the league. They have Minka Fitzpatrick at the safety position. I can just go on and on and on. And then on offense, they bring in tight end, six foot four, 253 pound target, Eric Ebron. Big Ben loves throwing to tight ends. I love this Steelers roster. Now, Vegas does too. Vegas loves the Steelers. They, they really do. They always do. Look at this. The Steelers, the Vegas put 9.5 wins for the Steelers in 2020. They love this roster. That is a big number, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. If the Steelers can go 8-8 eight and eight without Big Ben, then I would like to believe that Big Ben can win two more games for this team and give them a 10-win tw- season. Lock it in. Lock it in. Now, to the la- defending champions of the uh, NFC, AFC North, the Baltimore Ravens. 14-2 and two best record in the league last year, head coach John Harbaugh. What will Lamar Jackson and the Ravens do for an encore? That's the question. A 14-2 and two record and the number one overall seed in the entire playoffs is tough to top. However, did the Tennessee Titans figure out the blueprint for how to slow down the Ravens? in their 28-12 to dominating victory in the divisional round? That is one question everyone will be asking. The other question, can Lamar repeat the type of performance he had last year? I don't see anything that tells me no, other than injuries, and we never wish injuries on anyone. I see Lamar using that playoff loss as motivation to come back even and work harder. They have a really good head coach in John Harbaugh that will make sure the team stays motivated and comes back hungry. Their mastermind offensive coordinator and Greg Roman is returning, and that rarely happens after a team has an offensive season like the Ravens did. I mean, Matt Ryan and the Falcons, my Falcons have one huge year in 2016. The next year, our offensive coordinator is gone. That's how it always works. Not for Greg Roman, for some reason. He's back. The Ravens' run game is the key. It's, the high, it's why the offense is so potent. And last year, they had Mark Ingram. Gus Bradley, and now they bring in one of the best running backs coming out of college in J.K. Dobbins out of Ohio State. The wide receivers, Marquise Brown, is going into his second year. On the other side, they've got another speedster in Miles Boykin, 
who runs a 4-4-2 with a 6-foot frame, 6-foot-4 per frame, and showed a lot of flashes as a rookie. They added uh, Devin, uh, Devin DuVernay, the wide receiver out of Texas, who, who will probably play in the slot. And then they have Mark Andrews, who's a really good tight end and broke out last year and posted as the second best tight end in receiving grade in the entire league, according to our friends at Pro Football Focus. And then to top it all off, the Baltimore Ravens defense appears to be loaded next year. That was an issue. They weren't able to stop the run. The reason they got pounded by Tennessee is because they couldn't stop Derrick Henry. So what do they go out and do? They trade for Michael Brockers, big boy up in the middle. They trade for Khalil's Campbell, big boy up in the middle. In addition, they re-sign cornerback Jimmy Smith, allows their secondary to remain intact. Now they have big boys up front to, to stop the run. They have pass rushers in Michael Judon. This team is stacked all around. Their toughest out-of-division games includes trips to Philadelphia and Houston and home dates with Kansas City and Dallas. The winner of the AFC North will the winner of the AFC North has won 11 or more games in six of the last seven years, and that is going to continue. The Ravens won a total. Uh, the Ravens' win total by Vegas is 10.5. That means for them to go under, they would have to lose four more games than they did last year. I just do not see that happening with this roster, with Lamar Jackson, with John Harbaugh, and now with the revamped defense. Lamar is getting better by the year. Harbaugh is a top three coach in my eyes. The defense got better. The Ravens team is going over 10 wins, and you can seal that baby up and stamp it. No doubt about it. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it is time to dive into the final segment, the the, the segment you've all been waiting for, a little game of too high, too low, or just right. Stay tuned and figure out what that is all about right after this. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. back. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. We are rounding out the bases, going down to the final stretch of the show here, segment number four, the segment that everybody loves. Always try and do something fun for you guys. Um, I've hope, I hope everyone's enjoyed the show. We, we just finished up talking about uh, the AFC North. We've been doing our division tours. You know, we, we pre- predicted the AFC East with the Patriots winning. I know that looks a little crazy now with, with everything going on and all the players sitting out. We then went over to the AFC, uh, the NFC East where we picked the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, then we did the NFC North where we picked the Minnesota Vikings. A lot of surprise reaction there that we didn't go with the Packers. And then we just finished up the AFC North where we picked the Baltimore Ravens. Not much of a surprise on that one. We do have two playoff teams coming out. We have Pittsburgh getting a wild card, but the Ravens are too good, too fierce. Their offense is is hard to stop, and the defense just got better as well. So uh, I I hope you guys enjoyed those predictions, and and as always, you can use them against me if I'm wrong. Um, But now we're going to play the game that I've been teasing all show here. It's the game called uh, that everybody's really been waiting for, and it's called Too Much 
too little or just right. Excuse me, it's too high, too little or just right. And every single year, NFL players, what they do is they, they, they pretty much come around at this time and they cast their votes to identify the best in the league heading into the 2020 season. They pick a, essentially a top 100 players in the league. And, and, you know, then the media puts it all together and all that stuff, but they have the players vote on this. So it's like the players are picking their own peers of who's the best. And as you can imagine, this gets skewed. It's players picking. It, it gets a little wild. It gets out of hand. So we thought it would be fun to play a little game of pull out some of the players that are ranked and and, and tell the audience if we think that they're ranked too high, if they, we think they're ranked too low, or if we think they're at the just perfect spot, just right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually bring on some help here. Uh, we're going to have Sarah Mumford. Um, ask the questions and esteemed sports reporter for us. Um, and she's going to tell me a player. She's going to tell me where that player's ranked. And then she's going to ask me if they're too high, too low, or just right. Um, so, Sarah, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Hey, Kayvon. I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. We're super pumped that you're here. And are you ready to have some fun? I'm ready. Let's do it. Awesome, awesome. So, Perfect. Before we get into that real quick, sorry, I don't mean to hold you guys any longer, but um, I promised at the beginning of the show that that I had a bone to pick about the players leaving Carson Wentz off this list. Well, you guessed it. This is the freaking list that I was talking about. These players pick the 100 best players in the league, and you're telling me a quarterback that willed his team to the playoffs last year doesn't make the list? How is there any sense in that? Last year, Carson rank, Carson Wentz was ranked number three, third overall by his players of this list last year. What could he have possibly done since then? Oh, that's right. He took his team to the playoffs with his best player on offense being a tight end. This is a joke, and clearly, clearly what this means is that players just don't like Wentz for some reason. Or they just have never watched football and they just go through the motions when they play it. Because this makes absolutely no sense to me. Josh Allen was put on this list and Carson Wentz wasn't. I like Josh Allen. I really do. I've always talked very highly of him. But you are this this is just you are high on blank. Fill in the blank of any drug out there, and that's what you're on if you think that Josh and Josh Allen is better than Carson Wentz. That there's just no way. It just makes me so mad. If Carson Wentz was on the Bills, not only do they beat the Texans in that playoff game last year, but they are the second best team in the entire AFC coming into this season. That's right. They are better than the Ravens and right behind the Chiefs. It's so unfair to me. It's ridiculous. I cannot believe that his own peers did not put him on this list. All right. I had to get that out of the way first. Now let's bring it on. Sarah, let's start the show. Who do you have first? All right. First up is Darius Leonard. He's ranked number 50. Is Darius Leonard ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, this is a good one. Um, To me, he is ranked too low, okay? Darius Leonard, two seasons, two all-pro selections. He He's a Colts phenom linebacker. I mean, think about it. How can you make you, – you're in the league for two seasons, a young – linebacker out, out of South Carolina State up, Upstate. I mean, South Carol- University of South Carolina Upstate. Not the University of South Carolina, you know, the Gamecocks. The University of South Carolina Upstate. He comes into the league, and he's automatically two all-pro selections. Um, he, he has seven interceptions, 12 sacks, nine tackles for loss, and 284 tackles. Leonard has already put together quite the resume. It might not be much longer that we're calling him the best linebacker in the NFL. I just think that 50 is is too, I, I think that this is too low. He needs to be ranked higher because he's already in that top five linebackers in the NFL. So he should be ranked higher for that. Who do you have next? All right. Next up is Amari Cooper. He's ranked number 49. Is Amari Cooper ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, this is an interesting one. I know a lot of people are going to say that this is this is just right or even too low. This is way too high for me, to be honest. I mean, it, it just is. It's wild. Amari is a great player. 
He he really is, but he hasn't shown he can show up in the biggest spots. He he just hasn't. As the season went on, his stats got lower. It's happened every year. A lot of people fault him for not making himself go in the game in that Philadelphia game week 17. And I get that. I'm not someone that's going to fault him for that. If he was hurt, if he was tired, okay, I wish he was in the game. Of course, of course. He has not proved to me that he can take the double team on and that he can play in the big moments. In the big, big moments, he's a good wide receiver. He puts up stats. He, he's worth the money. But is he ranked number 49 out of all of his NFL peers? No, not to me. This is way too high. Who do you have next? Dak Prescott, who is ranked number 46. Is Dak Prescott ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, I think that anybody that's listened to this show so far um, can tell that I'm going to go, this is too high. I, 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 I hate to sound like I'm a Dak Prescott hater because I'm not. I, he's a great quarterback. You know, he, he's a franchise quarterback. He puts up stats, but he's just not the 46th best player in this league. He's just not. And, and the fact that his peers ranked him 46, but Carson Wentz is not ranked? I mean, how is that? They came out in the same draft. Carson Wentz beat him head-to-head last year when all the marbles were on the table. He had a better team in Dak Prescott. Carson Wentz had nobody, and he still showed up and beat him. Until Dak Prescott shows me that he can win the biggest games and he doesn't just have winning records against losing teams then I can't put my faith to say that he's the 46th best player out of his peers. I don't know what they're thinking here. This is way too high. Sarah, what do we have next? All right, next up is J.J. Watt, who is ranked number 45. What do you think? He's ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, this is another one too high. This is this is another one too high for me. I, I, I like J.J. Watt, you know, and he used to be the best defender in the entire game. The best defender in the entire game. He's gotten older. His body's starting to fall apart. Rightfully so. He's taken a lot of hits. I wish he could stay healthy because he's phenomenal for the game. But, I mean, look at this. The last four seasons, 2016, he had 1.5 sacks. He got injured, okay? 2017, he had zero sacks. Got injured again. 2018, he was healthy, and he had 16 sacks. Back to that dominant form. Then 2019, got injured again, four sacks. For a player to be 45, that is, you're just not playing enough to give me a ranked 45. I get the star power. I get the J.J. Watt, the muscles, all that stuff. Everyone loves him. Hey, he's a star in this league. But you got to put production out there, and he has not put production out there for me to say 45. He is too high. What do you got? All right, Jimmy Garoppolo, who is ranked number 43. Is Jimmy G ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. You're doing a great job here, Sarah. I love the questions. The um I, I'm for this one I'm going I'm going too low. Um Jimmy G, he gets a bad rep and I don't know why. Yes, he missed a big throw, actually a couple big throws in the Super Bowl. It was his first time playing as a starter in the Super Bowl. Jimmy G is a winner. Listen to this. Jimmy G got traded to San Francisco halfway through the 2017 year. The team was 1-10 in entering the last five games of the season. When they put Jimmy G in, he started those last five games, and he went 5-0. and The next season, he tore his ACL in Game 2. The team goes 4-10. and I mean, 4-12. and the, the, net, the following season, this past year, he's healthy all year, and the team goes 13-3 and and all the way to the Super Bowl. When he is in, the Niners win. When he's out... They're a top five. They're they're picking in the top five of the NFL draft. If that doesn't say something, then I don't know what does. That proves to me that he's a really good quarterback in this league, and he deserves to be ranked way higher than 43, way too low here. All right, next up is Alvin Kamar, who is ranked number 42. Is Alvin Kamar ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, this is this is crazy. He's ranked he's ranked way too low. I mean, he is a preeminent all-purpose weapon since day one. Kamara's made three Pro Bowls in three seasons. The Saints were going seven and nine, seven and nine, seven and nine, three years in a row until this man came into the picture. 
He is a do-it-all back that gives it his all every single down. He is one of those rare running backs in today's game that deserves the big money, even though the running back position is depreciating. I don't know how you can put someone that does catching, running, I mean, anything that you want him to do, he does it, and he's shown it three years in a row for the Saints. I think that this is way too low. He should have been ranked in the in, in the 30s. Um, and so, so too low for me on this one. Sarah, what do you have next? Okay, next up is Jadavon Clowney. Is he is ranked number 41? Is Clowney ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, another one that's too low. And this is going to be a controversial one. I know people are going to say, how can, he's not even on a team. How can you say he's too low? This guy's a game wrecker. And, and I get it. I get it. He's always injured. And lately, he has been, and that's fair. But when this guy is healthy, he can bust up an entire offensive game plan. We saw that through a couple of games last year when he was on the Seahawks. He, When he is healthy, he can be the most dominant defender in the league. He just has to stay healthy, and I know that is hard, but I'm judging him for what he has been on the field. And this is way too low for what he's been on the field. I know you guys can say, well, you just said J.J. Watt is too high because he's been injured. When J.J. Watt has been on the field, he hasn't done much. When Clowney's on the field, he wrecks games. He changes game plans. He completely changes what the offense is doing through the run game, through the pass game, whatever, you name it. This is way too low for me. Sarah, what do we have next? Next up is Mr. Odell Beckham, who is ranked number 59. Is Odell ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, awesome. Love the mister right there. Well done. Way to throw a twist into it. This is too low. This is too, too low. This is shocking to me. 59? 59. Do we not remember who Odell is? And look. He had a bad season last year. He had a bad season. He, I get it, okay? But he to drop down this much after one bad season, look, you guys know I'm not the biggest Odell fan out there. I'm not. I, I think that he gets hurt a lot. I think that he's a little bit small. But, but this is too low. It's disrespectful. The peers love him. I thought they did. I thought the kids loved watching him. He, he, he brings the flash. He brings the stardom. And for him to break 1,000 yards receiving every single year besides 2017 when he only had 25 catches because he was hurt majority of the season, that, that's crazy to me that he is not ranked higher than this. One bad season, that's it. And he still got in the 1,000-yard receiving last year even while playing hurt and even while having a quote-unquote bad season. This is way too low. Odell should have been ranked much higher, 40s, 30s for me. What do you have next? Next up is Kirk Cousins, who is ranked 58. Is Cousins ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, um, this is this is funny one. I, I think Kirk Cousins is ranked way too high here. Um, to, to tell me that Kirk Cousins is ranked 58, you know, it, it's look, he, he's a good QB and all. He's a franchise QB. I, I 100% understand that. But he did win a playoff game last year, and he broke those demons away. That That's awesome, all right? It's something that we've been criticizing him for a while. But he can't do anything unless the run game is happening. Unless they have the play-action run going, Cousins can't do much. And that's a huge problem. Offenses know that. Luckily, he's in such a good offense right now with such a good running back and such a good coach that they're creating different running schemes that's helping him do the play-action pass that he thrives on. But once that breaks down and in the playoffs that starts to, he does. he's not able to change pace. He's not able to do the big throws that he needs to throw during the big games like we saw against the 49ers after he did finally win that game against the Saints. It, this is just too high for me as a QB. Um, I, I like Kirk Cousins again. I said he's a starting quarterback, but this is just way too high for me at number 58. Who do you have next? Next up is DeForest Buckner, who is ranked number 56. Is DeForest Buckner ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, this is this is too low. This is too low. DeForest Buckner, th this man has been the 49ers' best defensive player the last two years. And, and before everyone goes and says, Whoa, whoa, what about Nick Bosa? Nick, Nick Bosa got there last year. I'm talking about the last two years. DeForest Buckner has been the best player on that team the last two years. The Colts had to give up a first-round pick to get him. That's how you know how good he is. He's a former top-ten pick in the draft. 
He's a second team all pro, and he is a huge reason why the 49ers made the Super Bowl last year. He can stop the run game. He can also create sacks. He can pressure up the middle. He can go outside. He is a quarterback nightmare. I think that uh, a defensive end, a defensive tackle like DeForest Buckner has a lot of value on the field, a lot of impact on the field, and that's why the Colts gave up a first-round pick for him, and that's why I think he's ranked way too low here. Uh, I think we have one more. What's that last one? Our final one is Zach Martin, who is ranked number 55. Is Martin ranked too high, too low, or just right? Yeah, um, to, to end it here, Zach Martin is ranked way too low. Look, the reason why Dak Prescott is even ranked in this is because that a, a lot has to do with Zach Martin. Zeke Elliott, a lot has to do with Zach Martin. Both those players are good. Zach Martin does everything for this team. He's been the best right guard in football for several years running, doesn't appear to be slowing down at age 29. Martin's earned his fourth first team all pro selection in 2019 and has made first or second team in all six of his seasons. He is on track right now for a Hall of Fame career and he's only 29 years old. Come on. An offensive position, an offensive lineman has so much impact. It protects your CEO of the, of the franchise in, in your quarterback. All right, it, it creates run uh, gaps for your running back. It creates time for your quarterback. It creates time for your running backs. Zach Martin is so important to this Dallas team. They are everything with him. They would be hurting a lot on that line without him. This is way, way too low. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. This was awesome. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll definitely have you back soon. Thank you so much for having me, Kayvon. I had a great time. Awesome, awesome. We hope that you guys also enjoy those interactive type topics. Um, I, you know, I always want to bring someone in like that. Not always, but here and there, just so other you guys can hear someone else's voice too. Uh, it's a ninety-minute show where I go over a lot and I talk and talk and talk. And my voice can be draining and, and, and get annoying, and I get all that, even though a lot of people like to say I have a lovely, lovely voice. But I understand how it works. You know, I love sports radio. I listen to sports radio. I, I get that. So I, I'm on, I, I understand. So, so that's why I want to bring in people like that sometimes, just to ask the questions, just to, so then I can answer it. And, and then you guys can get a little break from my voice of asking the question and answering it as well. Um, so, any, any ideas, any topics that you guys ever want me to talk about, please reach out to me. Let me know. We love getting y'all's advice. Once again, we love the way the show's going right now, and, and it seems like you do as well. So so please uh, keep, keep listening, and we always appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. This is the GSMC Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps. Uh, we got a really good one the other day, and we appreciate that. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, that, that, that will be much appreciative as well. Thank you to everyone for listening. Have a great rest of your night, and we will be back on Saturday. And let's see what type of news drops between now and then. We'll talk to you then. Have a good rest of your week. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.